Okay, so today's lesson is going to be on nuclear fission and fusion. This is where things get pretty weird, but uh, it does build off of a lot of the concepts that we've already talked about. Uh, so it shouldn't be too revolutionary or new. So here we go. So we're going to look at the processes of both nuclear fission and nuclear fusion today. First thing we're going to talk about is something called the nuclear binding energy. This is the energy that holds atoms together. Then we'll talk about nuclear fission, then nuclear fusion. Then we'll talk about using nuclear reactions as a source of energy very briefly. Uh, and then we'll do several examples calculating energy released from nuclear reactions. Uh, so again, uh, nuclear fission is like the process of breaking things down. Nuclear fusion is the process of bringing things together. We're going to look at all the energy calculations that would exist within those. Here we go. So first things first, nuclear binding energy. The nuclear binding energy is the net energy required to separate all of the nucleons within a nucleus into individual protons and neutrons. The binding energy is equal to the difference between the total energy of the individual nucleons and the energy of the nucleus. Basically, and this picture kind of shows it pretty well, when the nucleons are all separated, they have greater mass than they do when they're together. Now, in order to account for this, we have to understand that mass and energy are two sides of the same coin. They both are representations of the same essential property of the universe, basically. So in order to make up this deficit, we have to make sure that we have some extra energy involved. So the nucleus is really being held together by something called binding energy. So that energy, of course, uh, is what's holding all of these uh, nucleons together. So if you were to separate the nucleons, you would find that they have greater mass than all of them just together as one clump of a nucleus, right? And that's because that binding energy plays a role in it. So the binding energy is just the energy of the nucleon separately minus the energy of the nucleus. Now remember, mass and energy, like I said just a second ago, are two sides of the same coin. So really you could say it's like, it, it's, it's very much an analogy to the mass of the nucleus uh, right here and the mass of the nucleon separately because they're greater, right? Uh, so we'll often write this as either EB for binding energy or even just delta E, the change in energy. Uh, it's just the difference between the nucleon separated and the nucleus together, okay? Moving on. So uh, this energy is calculated using Einstein's famous equation relating energy and mass. That's E equals MC squared. So like we, like we uh, have mentioned before, if you have something of a certain mass, you can actually find what its energy equivalence is just by using this equation, right? So particles are sometimes classified by their energy equivalence, which is the amount of energy released should their entire mass be equated as energy. So if you had some way of turning the mass of an entire particle into just raw energy, uh, that would be where E equals MC squared comes into play. Okay, anyway, moving on. So. For an example, determine the energy equivalence of a proton. So we're gonna assume now that we somehow can take a single proton and turn it entirely into energy, just totally raw energy. So of course, this is gonna come from E equals MC squared. Uh, e is what we're looking for, it's the energy. Mass is something that's actually known. The mass of a proton as per our formula sheet is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Uh, and C of course is the speed of light, 3.0 times 10 to the eight. Uh, but notice it's C squared, so we'll have to square that on the outside here too. If you throw this in your calculator and then just round, I guess, to, uh, I guess really we should only have uh, three sig digs technically because of uh, the, the sig digs that were in the mass of the proton itself. I guess really it should be 1.50 times 10 to the negative 10. Uh, and of course that's going to be measured in joules. So if you had some way of turning all of the mass in a proton into energy, that's how much energy you get out of it. Uh, and notice that is several degrees higher, relatively speaking, than, uh, than the mass would be, right? The mass of a single proton is tiny. Imagine now instead if we have full kilogram of this, just how many joules of energy would be released from changing a kilogram mound of protons somehow uh, into raw energy. It's insane. All right, next one, the mass of a helium nucleus. Uh, and a helium nucleus, of course, uh, is two protons and two neutrons, uh, is, well, this right here, okay? Now, if the mass of a neutron is this much, this is a lot more specific than what the formula sheet gives, uh, and the mass of a proton is this much, just slightly less than a neutron, again, this is more specific than your formula sheet gives, uh, what is the binding energy of the helium nucleus? Uh, well, let's remind ourselves what binding energy really is here. Remember, binding energy, I'll call it EB this time. EB is really just the difference between the energy of your nucleons separately minus the energy of the nucleus altogether. The separate nucleons have more energy than the nucleus does together on like all is one, right? Uh, so the energy of the nucleons would be like the mass of all the nucleons combined uh, times C squared, because remember, if we're gonna break this down, 
energy of nucleons is still E equals mc squared. So it's the mass of the nucleons times c squared minus the mass of the nucleus times c squared. Well, let's start by finding the mass of the nucleons. I'm going to kind of just do it off on the side over here. M of the nucleons. Uh, is going to be the mass of your neutrons plus the mass of your protons. Well, judging by this right here, 4, 2 helium, uh, this says that there's two protons and four nucleons in total. The other uh, two nucleons, of course, must be uh, neutrons, right? Two protons, four in total. Just go four minus two. That tells you you got two neutrons, right? So if we deal with the neutrons first, we can say the mass of all the nucleons is two times the mass of a neutron, which is 1.6749 times 10 to the negative 27, plus the mass of the two pro protons, right? So two times uh, 1.6726 times 10 to the negative 27. Oops, 27, there we go, good. Uh, what that's gonna equal is about 6.695 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Notice this is a different mass than the mass of the nucleus that was given to us. And notice it is, in fact, just a little bit higher, right? That's a nine right there. Uh, so it is just a little bit higher than the mass of the nucleus all is one. So that's exactly what we were predicting with this. Let's now calculate it from here. Uh, the binding energy, EB, is therefore equal to the mass of the nucleons, so 6.695 times 10 to the negative 27, times C squared, so times 3.0 times 10 to the eighth, and then squared. Uh, minus the mass of the nucleus, the mass of the nucleus was given to us in the question as being 6.6443 times 10 to the negative 27, uh, also times by c squared, 3.0 times 10 to the 8 squared. Uh, now one thing I'm going to do before I actually calculate this, uh, another thing we could have done here, because notice there's a c squared on both of these, I'll just kind of write it in the middle between these two. What we could have done instead is we could have said eb is actually equal to the difference between your masses then times just c squared on its own. And that's because you could technically factor out a c squared out of both of these. So really you could say it was the mass of the nucleons minus the mass of the nucleus and then times that by c squared instead, right? That's probably actually a little bit easier, but we didn't do it that way. I, I just forgot, to be honest, but whatever. Let's throw this in now. EB, your binding energy, uh, to I guess we would need five sig digs in this question, uh, is going to be 4.5 six three zero uh, times 10 to the negative 12 joules. Now that's not the mass equivalent, or sorry, that's not the energy equivalence uh, of a helium nucleus. That's just the amount of energy that actually binds that nucleus together. That's how much energy is actually holding all of those individual nucleons, the protons and the neutrons, uh, all together, okay? So again, the binding energy is just the difference of the energies of the individual nucleons, that's right here, minus the nucleus all is one, okay? That's the binding energy, so it's holding it together. All right, so nuclear fission. Nuclear fission involves the splitting of the nucleus of, he of heavy elements, right? So the elements that are on the bottom of the periodic table. It often occurs when a free neutron collides with a large nucleus, which absorbs the neutron to form a highly unstable isotope, uh, and this is sometimes called proton bombardment. This isotope then instantly breaks apart into smaller nuclei because it's so, so unstable, uh, and it differs from radioactive decay because it is not spontaneous. Remember, radioactive decay, whether it was alpha, beta, or gamma, uh, that occurs on its own, just something sitting on its own, minding its own business. It's just how it operates, it's just how the universe functions. With nuclear fission, however, it has to be triggered by a neutron colliding like really quickly with a large nucleus. Uh, so the picture on the left there, of course, is showing uh, how it works for uranium, uh, more specifically uranium-235. I'll just highlight that there, uranium-235. Uh, if you strike a uranium-235 nucleus with a spare uh, neutron, the neutron, as long as it hits at the right velocity, is actually going to get absorbed and become part of this. So for a very brief moment, this doesn't actually show it, but for a very brief moment, you actually technically have uranium-236 instead of uranium-235. Now, uranium-235 is a lot more stable than uranium-236. Not fully stable by any means, but it certainly is a lot more stable than uranium-236. Once it's uranium-236, it doesn't want to be that anymore. So then it all of a sudden undergoes uh, quite an extensive process where it breaks down and it releases uh, basically some daughter nucleuses, 
or nuclei, I really should say, uh, one of which in this case, I guess, is barium, and then the other one is krypton. Uh, and it also releases a bunch of spare neutrons. Uh, so the math should all check out. Uh, if you add this number plus all this and this together, you should get uh, 236. Uh, now on the right, of course, it's probably been distracting you this entire slide. I can't really blame a nuclear weapon from distracting you. This is actually real test footage from the early 1950s. Uh, somewhere in, I believe, New Mexico, but it may have been Nevada, um, the U.S. detonating, of course, a nuclear fission weapon, right? And this is one of the one of the special ones that they had done where they actually launched it out of a cannon, which is a, a bit of a different way of going about it, um, but really fascinating. Terrifying, uh, but also fascinating. Pretty sure I've told you guys the story as well. My, my grandparents on my mom's side, they got married in 1953. And uh, for their honeymoon, they went down to Las Vegas. And Las Vegas, of course, was nothing like it is today, but it was still starting to become a very prominent thing back in 1953. Long story short, though, uh, one, one, I think it was one evening, um, my grandpa actually found out that there was going to be a nuclear test. They literally just did these nuclear tests back in the 1950s. And without telling my grandma, he actually took her out uh, and uh, they went to like a, a place that was pretty much on the top of a cliff and there were a bunch of other people waiting. My grandma had no idea what was gonna go on. Uh, and then of, of course, sure enough, way in the distance, they watched a nuclear weapon detonate, which is an absolutely horrible, horribly bad idea uh, because of course, as soon as a nuclear weapon detonates, as we've seen before, it's releasing a huge amount of radiation. Uh, and that radiation is striking you at the speed of light. When you're watching this picture here, as soon as you see that nuclear weapon detonate uh, and all that huge flash of light right there, uh, a lot of that light isn't just visible. There's a lot of gamma rays and X-rays and all these other very highly ionizing radiation uh, photons uh, that are bombarding you at all times. And that, and that can cause some very serious health effects uh, from that nuclear fallout. But anyway, we're gonna move on from there. Uh, let's see. Okay, so a small amount of mass disappears during fission. Uh, this difference in mass is called the mass defect, right? So the mass that disappears is called the mass defect. Nuclear fission releases a tremendous amount of energy, which can, which can be calculated using Einstein's equation. Uh, e equals, and they've just adapted it uh, to be the initial mass uh, minus the final mass times c squared. Because remember, your initial mass, so the mass of, let's say, that uranium-236, after it's been struck by that neutron, is going to be greater than that final mass of all the components combined. Uh, and that is because the energy that's released in a nuclear blast has some mass equivalents. And that is the mass defect right there. That mass, quote unquote, disappears um, because it gets released as an absolutely gigantic amount of energy in the form of a nuclear explosion. Uh, so in addition to splitting the nucleus of an element into two new elements, nuclear fission uh, also releases additional neutrons. We saw that in that one picture on the last slide. Uh, this starts a chain reaction because these additional neutrons can then split other nuclei. So that's, again, how a nuclear uh, weapon would work. Um, Inside the nuclear weapon, they'll have like a, a sample of uranium. Let's just say it's like it's a lump right there, right? Uh, of, you know, trillions or quadrillions of atoms of uranium in there. And you strike it with a neutron. Uh, that's just going to trigger whichever one it happened to hit. But as soon as it triggers that one, that one releases a bunch of neutrons, which then collides into the next one and may start releasing a bunch of neutrons, which collides into the next ones. And this all happens within like, like the blink of an eye. Uh, and the whole thing basically converts uh, to new matter all at once. So... Crazy, very, very crazy process. Uh, so there it is again. Uh, this one's actually a much better picture than the one that was on the other slide. Oh, and I see there's three neutrons that are released. That's what I was actually thinking. I was gonna say, well, yeah, there's two, but you know, if you add them up, it should work. You know, I, I, maybe I'd have to go back and check, but yeah, I always remember that there were three neutrons released from there. You won't have to memorize how many are released from there. I'll always give that to you, but you just need to know how the process goes, of course. So again, the idea is a neutron strikes a stable nucleus, so like uranium-235, forces it to become uranium-236 now because it's added a new neutron in there. That's very unstable, uh, so it breaks apart and releases a gigantic amount of energy as well as a bunch of extra neutrons. So that's how nuclear fission works. Nuclear fission doesn't have to happen with uranium. That's just the one we're looking at. There's several other things that can undergo uh, nuclear fission as well, uh, but that's just a very common one that we'll use for a lot of examples. Uh, all right, so nuclear fission using uranium produces two million times the amount of energy as the equivalent mass of coal. Uh, hence why, of course, it's such, uh, such a huge blast, clearly, right? Now, nuclear fission, however, also produces radioactive isotopes, which release potentially harmful alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Uh, give two examples of where nuclear fission occurs. Well, we've talked about nuclear weapons. Uh, that one's maybe a little bit too obvious. I don't know if I really want to, to say that one again, 
but another one that I think is also still pretty obvious is nuclear power plants, right? Uh, every nuclear power plant in existence today uh, is operating under nuclear fission. We'd like to start getting them to operate under nuclear fusion. We'll talk about that a little later in this lesson. Um, but the ones that we do use use nuclear fission rather than fusion, okay? Uh, another place, and this one I will list because it is kind of something you wouldn't necessarily think of happening. Uh, another place that nuclear fission occurs is actually deep in Earth's mantle. So way, way, way underground, uh, there are some small nuclear fission reactions that are happening. It, it's not a gargantuan blast like we would experience at the surface in a nuclear weapon by any means, uh, but there is uh, believed to be a lot of nuclear fission going on down deep in the, uh, the, the mantle of the Earth, right? Anyway, moving on. We won't need to know that too much. All right, next up, nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the opposite of fission because instead of splitting large nuclei, small nuclei are combined into heavier elements. Uh, and nuclear fusion always involves at least two reactants, which must be lighter elements, right? So the very common ones that we use are, are usually like hydrogen and helium, right? Those are the ones that are, are often used. They're the very uh, lowest uh, or lightest, I should say, elements on the periodic table. So they're the very common ones to use in nuclear fusion reactions. Uh, but you can use higher ones as well, right? It can go, it can go much bigger than that. Uh, even though two nuclei are fused together, Mass is still lost in a fusion reaction because of the mass energy equivalence principle. Nuclear fusion requires extremely high temperatures because a huge amount of energy is required for the two positive nuclei to fuse together uh, despite their repulsive electrical force, right? Uh, so again, what's really happening is if you have, let's say just hydrogen, so we got like a hydrogen here, let's say there's your electron buzzing around it, and another hydrogen with its electron buzzing around it, what you're doing when you're fusing it together is you're pushing them together so that those two uh, nuclei, nuclei uh, form together and actually stick. But remember, nuclei are uh, net positive charge, uh, and of course there's going to be an electromagnetic force uh, repelling them away from each other. So you have to under, uh, overcome that somehow by inserting a lot of energy to actually get them to stick together. Okay? Uh, but yes, even though you're putting in a lot of input energy, there will still be a huge amount of energy released uh, because again, uh, the mass of things that are separated is greater than the mass of things that are together, uh, so that energy has to go somewhere. That's what I refer to with that mass energy equivalence principle. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, this is two different types of hydrogen. We've talked about these before. There's deuterium, uh, which again is just a certain isotope of hydrogen, and then tritium, which is one we've talked about several times now. That's that glow-in-the-dark one. Um, it's another isotope of hydrogen. Notice there's only one proton in each of these. One proton defines something as being hydrogen. Uh, if you somehow manage to fuse these together, you're actually going to create helium. So notice two protons, two neutrons. Uh, a neutron gets released out of that as well, just because, of course, you have to keep your number of particles the same. There's three neutrons going in. There has to be three neutrons going out, uh, unless some really weird process, uh, like the, the certain kinds of decay we saw before, uh, starts happening here. But that's a different story altogether. Uh, but most notably, a huge amount of energy gets released. The only thing I don't like about this, uh, this picture is that you also need a huge amount of energy to go into it as well, right? And they didn't, really, they didn't really list that. I guess it's kind of part of the fusion process. There has to be energy that does that. Um, but again, there is a net amount of energy that gets released from this as well. The energy input is not as big as the energy output. The energy output is gonna be uh, quite substantial, okay? Anyway, moving on. Uh, give two examples of where nuclear fusion uh, occurs. Um, well, nuclear fusion can occur in a bunch of different places. I'll start with one that might be pretty obvious to us as well. There are actually nuclear fusion weapons. You've probably heard of something called a hydrogen bomb before. Uh, hydrogen bombs are a nuclear fusion weapon. So I'll even write that, I'll call it a hydrogen bomb, right? It's a type of nuclear weapon, a very, very extreme nuclear weapon. Hydrogen bombs were, were, were much more effective, generally speaking, than uh, the nuclear fission bombs that we've been looking at. Uh, but another place where nuclear fusion occurs, and this one is extremely important, uh, literally every star. So inside of stars, uh, there are constant nuclear fusion reactions occurring. That's what makes a star a star. That's the reason stars are glowing in the sky. It's because it's a gigantic, uh, like absolutely gigantic nuclear fusion reactor that is constantly burning. Uh, that, of course, includes our own sun. The sun is a star, after all. It's just the star that's closest to us. Uh, so inside the core of the sun, uh, there is a nuclear fusion reaction occurring that is actually putting 
hydrogen and stuff in them together to create helium. Uh, so the following are examples of nuclear fusion reactions that dominate the solar interior. Uh, so uh, here's the one, I guess it'd be four deuterium uh, atoms. Remember, it's hydrogen two, that's deuterium. Uh, so four deuterium, deuterium atoms combining together to create helium, two beta negative particles. Remember, a beta negative particle is just a fancy way of saying an electron. Uh, two neutrinos and seven gamma rays. Right, and I'm pretty sure that is correct. That's not supposed to be an anti-neutrino. Yeah, I think it is just a normal neutrino, not an anti-neutrino. Uh, this is not beta negative decay. Don't don't go thinking that this is beta negative decay. This is a nuclear fusion reaction. It's not the same thing. Uh, but then of course seven gamma rays. That one definitely makes sense. And that's for every four deuterium atoms that go into it. Uh, another one that happens though is deuterium can combine with tritium. That's like that picture we saw just a second ago, and that creates a helium. Uh, atom as well as one neutron that gets released from it as well. You don't need to know these. Like by no means do you need to know these. I just want you to understand that nuclear fusion occurs by basically combining uh, a bunch of particles together. And in this case, it was four deuterium atoms combining together, fusing together to form uh, helium and all this other stuff. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Uh, let's see here. So nuclear fusion in stars. Uh, yeah, here we go. I know what this one's all about. Um, so let's say you had a super giant star. This is not like our sun. Our sun is nowhere near being a super giant star. As a matter of fact, our sun is actually uh, pretty low end of average, actually, when it comes to, to all stars. Um, but a super giant star that's right at the end of its life cycle is actually going to be uh, performing a bunch of different kinds of fusion reactions all at once. Uh, like almost every other star, uh, there's hydrogen inside of it uh, fusing into helium. So hydrogen fuses to become helium. But as a star gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and the conditions in the core of the star get more and more intense, you can actually get it to a point where there's enough energy provided uh, to actually fuse helium. And helium will fuse together, I believe, to form carbon. Uh, now, carbon actually under extreme enough circumstances, so that's why I'm really saying, you know, emphasis on the super part of this, carbon under extreme enough situations uh, can actually fuse together to form neon. And then neon under uh, extreme situations can form uh, oxygen and then it can go down to silicon. Uh, and then the last step in all stars is iron. Iron is the last thing that can fuse together. Uh, iron will not perform a fusion reaction, uh, generally speaking, of course, in any star. Uh, so once an, uh, a, a giant, super giant star starts fusing iron together in its core, uh, it's literally in its final like days, basically, right? It's right at the end of its life cycle. That thing is gonna blow up and go supernova at any minute. Uh, now, when a supernova occurs, that's a totally different discussion, um, but supernova uh, it is such an immense, like, like I, can't, I don't even have words to describe how much energy is released in a supernova, because what a supernova can do is it can take all of this stuff that the star had been making in its entire lifetime and actually perform really, really, really bizarre fusion reactions to create everything on the periodic table higher than iron, um, which is mind-blowing for a lot of people. Anything that you can find on Earth that is higher on the periodic table than iron had to have formed in a supernova at some point in the past. Right now, I'm wearing a gold ring. Gold is, of course, much higher than iron is on the periodic table. Uh, gold, as an element, had to have formed in a supernova, just like anything else above it uh, on the periodic table, as long as, of course, it was naturally occurring and humans didn't just make it in a lab, right? Um, which again, gold, you can't exactly do that. We haven't figured out alchemy by any means, but supernovas are responsible for everything above iron on a periodic table. And again, if you have a glance at your periodic table and find iron, uh, you're gonna see exactly just how much uh, of the periodic table that is, it's like literally like three quarters of it, right? It's a huge amount of the periodic table that is uh, dominated by things that uh, were produced in supernovas. Crazy. Anyway, moving on, moving on. And again, there's, there's a lot more to it than that. That's just, uh, that's just how the, the process goes. But anyway, so nuclear fission versus nuclear fusion, pros and cons of both of them. Uh, now this is under the context of using nuclear fission and nuclear fusion for producing energy for human use. So in other words, uh, a nuclear fission power plant versus a theoretical nuclear fusion power plant. Now make it, uh, let me make it just really clear here. Nuclear fusion power plants don't fully exist yet, right? This isn't something that is like really, really happening right now. Um, but scientists are actively working on getting a nuclear fusion reactor working and actually functional 
because it is very, very strongly believed that once we have nuclear fusion wor uh, working, uh, we've pretty much solved our energy problems forever. Uh, nuclear fusion has that much potential. So here's some advantages and disadvantages. For fission, some advantages of doing nuclear fission, so the way that nuclear reactors already work, is that there's less emissions than other forms of power. Certainly things like coal or natural gas, which actually uh, create a lot of emissions, uh, nuclear fission doesn't produce those types of emissions, right? So in other words, there's not, there's not greenhouse gases escaping from a nuclear fission reactor uh, as much as it may look like it. There's a lot of steam that comes off of it, uh, but no greenhouse gases. Uh, it produces way more energy than conventional power. Nuclear power right now is second to none. It is by far the most effective way of producing energy, um, but of course that isn't to say it's not without its downsides. We'll get to those in a second. Uh, another advantage is, relatively speaking, there's low operating costs. Um, that's more in terms of like the bang for your buck kind of idea, right? In terms of how much energy you're getting out of it, the amount you're spending on getting that energy is not as high as some other, uh, some other forms of energy. Now we need to talk about the disadvantages because they are very considerable. Uh, disadvantages of nuclear fusion are that there are radioactive byproducts that are produced from it, right? So in other words, in a nuclear fission reactor, there are byproducts that are produced from this that have to be stored away very, very safely. Uh, and it's important that those uh, byproducts don't find their way into the environment because they can be very, very, very dangerous. Uh, speaking of which, it's dangerous to work with. People who work in nuclear uh, power plants need to be extremely well trained on how to deal with the nuclear fissile material, right? Because it's very, very dangerous. Also, it's expensive to set up. A nuclear fission reactor is not something you can just, you know, drop money on right away and say, oh, it's going to get built. It, it is a huge expense. They are immensely expensive. They, they are one of, if not the most expensive thing to set up. I would argue hydroelectric is also an extremely expensive one. Of course, like building a giant hydroelectric dam is also really expensive. But again, nuclear fission uh, uh, is, is very expensive to set up. That's all I'm getting at here. Uh, last uh, disadvantage is risk of contamination. And we've seen this uh, several times throughout uh, the last 50 years in particular. Chernobyl is probably the most well-known example. Chernobyl, of course, uh, was a nuclear fission reactor that uh, had a meltdown back in the 1980s. It was caused mostly by uh, poor oversight, not only from the people who were working there, but also from the people who designed it, as well as from uh, the Soviet government. It was a whole mess all around. Um, but nuclear power plant disasters are not something that uh, are exclusive to the Soviet Union by any means. Uh, the United States had one called the Three Mile Island Disaster, which was also a very considerable nuclear fission reactor meltdown. Uh, and then, of course, back in 2011, I was in university at the time, there was a, a giant earthquake and tsunami in Japan, uh, in Japan, sorry, and it uh, uh, destroyed a nuclear fission reactor called the, uh, I think it was Fukushima, I think is what it was called. Um, but again, and that one also had a very huge uh, meltdown as well. So very, very dangerous, huge amount of contamination. And by the way, uh, the one from Japan about 10 years ago, uh, radiation from that made its way and actually uh, was found on the coast of Canada as well, right? So this is something that even though it happened on the other side of the world, uh, that radiation and that contamination still found its way to other places, even our own country. Uh, now nuclear fusion, on the other hand, remember this doesn't quite exist yet, but hopefully we're getting there. Uh, some advantages, it's extremely large amounts of power that get produced from it, and extremely is an understatement. Uh, nuclear fusion, if we could get it to work, would, would be way better than anything. There would be no arguing. Nuclear fusion would be the number one way of producing energy. End of story, close of book. Uh, it would also be relatively simple to control. Once you've got it going, uh, it shouldn't be too hard uh, to control. And then one of the biggest advantages of nuclear fusion is there's no greenhouse gas emissions whatsoever. And by that, I mean like not even steam. You're not even releasing steam from this. Like it, it's that incredible, uh, or at least you shouldn't be. There wouldn't be any reason to. Um, but a nuclear fusion reactor, um, the byproduct of nuclear fusion would be helium. You'd, like in other words, you'd have just enough like helium to, to like, you know, pretty much have enough for every balloon at every birthday party in existence, right? Like you'd be good from that. that that's, that's about it, right? And helium, he, if you released helium into our atmosphere, it's not going to stay in our atmosphere. That's what I'm trying to say here. It'll literally be sent out and it would actually find its way into space, okay? Uh, now some disadvantages of nuclear fusion, there are quite a few. Uh, it would require a lot of energy just to initiate. Remember, in order to actually get those uh, nuclei to stick together, you need to have a lot of energy in the first place. Uh, and that's a big issue right now because we can get things to fuse together um, but it's just in order to, to, to get enough energy out of it, that's, that's what we're trying to figure out. Uh, it's not very well understood. That's the big stumbling block right now. Uh, the eventual setup will be extremely expensive. We're talking 
tens of billions of dollars at least. Like there's a huge amount of money that's already been poured into it. Who knows what on earth fusion reactors would cost. Uh, and currently it's not known how to get it to yield a net amount of energy. So in other words, we need to have energy going in. We also would need to have energy coming out. We're just trying to find a way to get more energy out of it than we put into it. And that's quite tough right now. All right, we're gonna run through a bunch of examples. I've already gone like really long on this and I apologize, but it is a very interesting topic. So uh, let's make sure we wrap these up. Um, so first question here, calculate the energy released in the fission reaction of a single uranium-235 atom. Notice I've got the individual uh, nucleus masses all on the side here. Those are gonna be pretty uh, important. Uh, basically how we do this is the energy released just comes out of E equals mc squared, but you just have to understand that E is gonna equal your initial mass minus your final mass times C squared, because the mass defect is what's being released uh, as energy in these fission reactions. Uh, so the initial mass, maybe we should find that first, the initial mass here uh, is just gonna be the mass of uranium, so right here, plus the mass of a neutron. Uh, I could write that down, I'll save us time here. It's just literally this guy plus this guy, uh, and that's gonna be 3.919649 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms. Now, the final mass, on the other hand, is gonna be the mass of all of these guys combined. And just take note, there's three neutrons, so we would have to times this guy by three. Once again, I'll spare you the trouble of writing all that down. It's literally just this right here, the barium, plus the krypton, uh, plus three times this, okay? The final mass is going to be 3.916547 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms. So therefore, E is going to equal the difference between these two. You can tell, you have to look at the thousandth place right here, but you can tell that the initial mass is very slightly more than the final mass. Uh, so we can just subtract those two. 3.919649 times 10 to the negative 25 minus 3.916547 times 10 to the negative 25. Close the brackets off and then times that by C squared. So 3.0 times 10 to the 8 squared. Therefore, the energy released for just one single uranium-235 atom is to five sig digs here, because we have to use the numbers we were given, 2.7918 times 10 to the negative 11 joules. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna speed through this. It's like the longest video we've ever had. Uh, next one, burning one kilogram of gasoline releases that much energy. What mass of uranium-235 would provide the same amount of energy? Um, okay, so that's kind of weird. Uh, we have, hmm, let's see here. Okay, oh, all right, I see where we're going with this. Um, so basically what we have to do is we could take the amount of energy that gasoline releases, so 4.4 .4 times 10 to the seven joules. If we divide that by um, how much energy uranium-235 produces, which is 2.7918 times 10 to the negative 11, that'll tell us how many uh, atoms of uranium-235 we would need, right? Because this is how much one atom provides, and this is how much we want, right? So if you divide how much we want by how many atoms, or how much one atom produces, that'll tell us how many atoms we would need to get that, okay? So the number of atoms of uranium-235 we're gonna need are 1.57604 times 10 to the 18 atoms. Now, each atom has a mass of 3.9029 times 10 to the negative 25. That again was given up in that top right-hand corner. Uh, so we just need to multiply those two things together and that'll tell us the mass, of course, uh, of how much uranium we need to produce that amount of energy. Because again, this is how many atoms we need, this is how many kilograms there are per atom. So this will tell us how many kilograms we have. But anyway, you calculate these two together, uh, I guess we only need two sig digs because of the question. Uh, it's going to give us 6.2 times 10 to the negative 7 kilograms. So really not a lot of uranium to release uh, the same amount of energy as a full kilogram of gasoline. That would be like a, like a little handheld jug of gasoline. Uh, and you would need like hardly any uranium at all to do that. Like that's less than a single gram. Crazy, crazy, crazy. All right, next example. Calculate the energy released in the following fusion reaction. Um, again, a fusion reaction, the amount of the energy released is the same as it was uh, with the other ones. It's E equals your initial mass minus your final mass times C squared. Uh, so again, 
Look at your initial things. We have uh, deuterium and tritium. That's right here. You just have to add them together. So our initial mass is 8.35276 times 10 to the negative 27. And that again comes from adding those two things together. Uh, and as for our final mass, we'd have to add helium plus a neutron. And again, I'll save you the trouble. It's 8.32140 times 10 to the negative 27. And what do you know? Your initial mass was more than the final mass, as it should be. Uh, so we can definitely do this. So E equals, you know what? I'll just skip it all. You know, just minus these two numbers together and times by C squared. It's end of story. So it's going to be 2.82240 times 10 to the negative 12 joules. There you go. Boom. All right. One more. One more example. I swear. Last one here. Um, calculate the energy released per nucleon in the following nuclear reaction. Note that helium uh, three has a mass of this. Okay, so helium three instead of helium four, that's what we're dealing with here. Notice uh, this is a nuclear reaction. There's a lot of energy being released. That stands for mega electron volts. So that's a certain amount of energy. Um, now energy released will be the nuclear binding energy plus the additional energy uh, that the reaction implies. Uh, so what I'm really saying here is this energy still has to be accounted for in our final amount, and then we have to divide by the number of nucleons we basically have, okay? Bottom line is here, just like before, let's ignore this number for a second here, although I will turn it into joules. If you times that by um, 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19, you're actually gonna find that this is 1.6384 times 10 to the negative 12, oops, not negative two, negative 12 joules. Uh, but we'll ignore this number for now, and we'll use it in our final answer here because, again, we have to uh, account for that as being energy that's released. But there's going to be other energy that happens from here. Let's, let's find out. Uh, so, again, we need to find uh, E equals MI minus uh, MF times C squared. Uh, the initial mass we can uh, add together from, uh, I believe, one of the previous questions had it. The bottom line is MI is going to equal 6.68. 898 times 10 to the negative 27. And your final mass is going to equal, well, we have to take this plus the mass of a neutron. We'll use that mass number from the previous question. Uh, it's going to be 6.68316 uh, times 10 to the negative 27. So again, we can notice the final mass is a little less than the initial mass. Calculate your energy from this. Energy is therefore going to equal 5.238 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. Now, that is the energy released just inherent in this formula itself. This additional amount of energy is coming in afterwards as well. So we need to add that on in order to account for it. If you add that on to it now, you're going to find that you have 2.1622 uh, times 10 to the negative 12 joules. Now, we now have to release, or sorry, we now have to divide this by the number of nucleons that exist in this reaction. Now, regardless of whether you look on the left side or the right side of this uh, equation, you're gonna see that there's four nucleons in total. There's two plus two here, three plus one here. So we should just divide this by four nucleons now. Dividing that by four gives us our final answer, finally, of 5.4055 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. Whew, holy smokes. Okay, that was the longest lesson ever for practice. Please make sure you're working on your atomic physics assignment that is due this Friday. You can now do, I think, up to about question 26 uh, on that one. And you might also want to try some of the questions in the nuclear fission slash fusion worksheet. That's page 58 to 60. Anyway, as always, guys, if you need any help, please let me know.